This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and today is Friday, and that means it's time for the 538th MTG Top 10. Most of the time in this series, I take a look at the best and worst cards in a particular category, but sometimes I like to do videos that look at broader events in Magic's history. This is something I'm going to do a little more regularly, now that I'm doing three MTG Top 10s a week, and that's what we're doing today with a look at the 10 biggest rule changes in the history of Magic. But first, let me tell you about this video's special sponsor, Dark Duel, an exciting and innovative new digital game. It combines chess and collectible card games, making for some really interesting gameplay. You play cards on a board, and those cards have a ton of different stats, moves, and abilities. Both players start with a king on the board, and the game ends when one of those kings dies. There are also tribal effects, of course, that pay you off for playing a bunch of creatures with the same type sort of like what we see in Magic. For example, Great Monarch can heal your insects and plants. If all of that sounds good to you, you should try out this fascinating new game. You can find a link in the description. All right, now back to the video. Magic is almost 30 years old, so it's no surprise that the rules have changed countless times across the game's history. Rules changes are even introduced with the release of every new set, but some rule changes are more meaningful than others. Obviously enough, this list is based on my own opinion, but every rule change on this list drastically altered the game, either completely changing how the game itself worked, or drastically altering the functionality of a huge number of cards. So while it is based on my opinion, I'll be explaining why my opinion is what it is. All right, without further ado, let's take a look at the 10 biggest rule changes in the history of Magic. At number 10, I have the elimination of the rule that the effect of an artifact only is active if it's untapped. This change was introduced with the release of 6th edition in April of 1999, and it's not the only rule change on the list to be introduced with that set. As you can surmise from what I've said so far, originally, artifacts didn't work if they were tapped. In other words, their effect was no longer in force, whether it was continuous or an activated ability. For example, if you tap down an opposing Zuron orb, your opponent couldn't use its effect again until it untapped. This is something that was pretty central to the game, to the point that there were so-called mono artifacts, like Candelabra of Thanos, that had an ability but built into that mono artifact type was the fact that they got tapped when you used them once. There were also poly artifacts like Force Field, which allowed you to use its ability as many times as you wanted without tapping it. No tap symbol was necessary on these mono artifacts because the whole mono artifact thing meant it tapped, and once it tapped, the text on the card was effectively blank. This meant for symmetrical effects, you could tap down an artifact so it didn't affect you, and you could also shut down an opposing artifact entirely by using Icy Manipulate, and this was one reason that the Manipulator was a much better card in the old days. Interestingly, they did decide to preserve this functionality on two of the most notable artifacts of the era, Howling Mine and Winter Orb. Players would tap these down so the effects weren't really symmetrical. If you tap the mine, your opponent wouldn't be able to draw the card, and if you tap the orb, you could ignore its prison effect. Both of these cards don't have the untapped clause on their original printings because it wasn't necessary. The fact that they turned off when they were tapped was just part of the game. But the text for these cards today specifically says that they only work when they are untapped. Sort of a relic of this old rule. It is pretty neat they did this so you can still do the same thing with these two artifacts that you could do in the pre-1999 rules. This rule change drastically altered how artifacts work, and obviously mono artifacts and poly artifacts and continuous artifacts were all retired, and now they're just all artifacts, so in a lot of ways this just simplified things. A similar rule change related to a tapped card being weaker is sort of an honorable mention here. Originally, tap blockers didn't do combat damage, so if you could find a way to tap a creature after it blocked, you could create more advantageous situations for your creatures. This was also changed with 6th edition of the rule we know today, so now tap creatures still do combat damage when blocking. Like with the artifact rule, this was a fairly unnecessary one that made the game significantly more complicated. Complicated. While this rule change is significant, obviously I didn't quite think it was a big enough deal to make the list proper. At number 9, I have the change in the way Planeswalkers were dealt non-combat damage. Before the release of Dominaria in April 2018, you couldn't target them directly with something like Lightning Bolt. First you had to target the player, and then decide whether you wanted to redirect the damage to one of their Planeswalkers. 
This is certainly another case where the game was simplified by a rule change. In short, Planeswalkers didn't take damage in a straightforward way at all. This added an entire unnecessary step to things, and it also had an effect on the rules text of thousands of cards when they changed it. Most spells that damaged a creature or player now do damage to any target, to make it clear that you can just point them at Planeswalkers. Additionally, any card that could damage only a player, like Boros Charm, can also damage a Planeswalker now. This didn't have a super dramatic effect on actual functionality of cards, but it streamlined a pretty big aspect of the game, as planeswalkers are everywhere, and it led to the change of the text of thousands of cards too. At number 8 I have another change to the rules regarding planeswalkers. Starting with Ixalan in September 2017, planeswalkers gained the legendary super type, and the planeswalker uniqueness rule was eliminated. Originally, Planeswalkers weren't legendary, and you could only control one Planeswalker with a given type. In other words, you couldn't control both Jace Balaran and Jace the Mind Sculptor at the same time. This made some sense flavor-wise, as having multiple incarnations of a given Planeswalker feels a little weird, but at the same time we can do it with legendary creatures that represented the same individual, so why not Planeswalkers? Following the change, you could control as many Planeswalkers with the same type as you wanted, but they were now legendary. So in theory, it would be difficult to control two identical Planeswalkers at the same time, but now you could control as many Planeswalkers as you want with the same type as long as they have different names. This really powered up Planeswalkers in general, as now decks could run multiple walkers with the same type. In Modern, for example, people were pretty pumped that it would be much easier to play Liliana of the Veil and Liliana the Last Hope in your deck, and you could even have them both in play at the same time. This also opened up some interesting design space, making cards like Jace Cunning Castaway and Obnixilus the Adversary possible. Jace is actually the card they used to introduce us to this rule change, both Jace and Obnixilus make non-legendary copies of themselves, giving you multiples of the same Planeswalker. You can also now build decks that are Planeswalker tribal, built around a specific Planeswalker type, so cards like Chandra's Regulator could be printed. In a lot of ways, this rule change made Planeswalkers an even bigger aspect of magic, and whether you think that's a good or a bad thing, it certainly changed things in a big way. At number 7, I have a change in when a player's life total was checked to see when they would lose the game for having zero or less life. Starting with April 1999, 6th edition, life totals were now checked any time a player was about to receive priority. And if your life total was zero or less, you lost the game. Put more simply, you pretty much lose the game immediately when your life goes to zero. Originally, your life total was only checked at the end of a phase. This played a key role in some of Magic's earliest decks, most notably in Prosbloom combo decks, which could drop their life to zero with multiple Infernal Contracts, but then make a ton of mana with Cadaverous Bloom and cast Drain Life, which would usually allow them to kill the opponent while also making sure their life total got back above zero. Perhaps the best way to show you how drastically different the game was is to look at a card like Mirror Universe. This artifact lets you sacrifice it to switch life totals with your opponent. By today's standards, this is an absolutely awful card. But in the days when your life total could drop to zero or below and you had until the end of the phase before you would lose, you could find a way to pay all of this life and then use this so your opponent would lose at the end of the phase. This led to Mirror Universe being restricted in 1994 and it remained either banned or restricted in all of Magic's formats before this rule change was implemented in April of 1999, at which point it became the awful card it is today. Sucks for Mirror Universe to go from being a much feared card that had to be banned to being a card no one wants to play. This is also another rule change that just makes intuitive sense. I mean, if you have zero life, you should probably just be dead instead of being able to do all sorts of stuff before the end of your phase. At number 6, I have two mana-related rule changes that came with the release of Core Set 2010 in July of 2009. These are the complete elimination of mana burn, as well as mana now emptying from your mana pool more regularly. Originally, you took one damage every time unused mana was emptied from your mana pool. This was called mana burn. Additionally, mana only emptied out of your mana pool at the end of each phase. With the release of Corset 2010, it now emptied at the end of each step, as well as at the end of each phase, so this was no longer possible. Getting rid of mana burn removed the downside of cards that produced mana for you as part of a trigger like Braid of Fire or Su Chi, and in general it eliminated the downside associated with cards that produce a ton of mana. While people often like to go with the Braid of Fire example, it didn't really have a big impact on competitive magic. Some other more relevant cards that got better 
as a result of this rule change include Lotus, Cobra, and Mana Drain. These cards used to have some downside associated with their mana production. Now, they were all upside. To be honest though, getting rid of this rule hasn't had as seismic of an effect on Magic as you might think. It changed things for sure, but was mostly just an obnoxious rule, not one that was ultra central to the game. In the end, they got rid of it because it made the game unnecessarily complicated and wasn't exactly intuitive. It also felt pretty bad that cards that produce extra mana for you came with such a significant significant downside, especially for newer players. Making mana empty at the end of each step and not just the end of each phase was more impactful. This really changed how some decks played the game, as many decks like to produce mana during their upkeep and then spend it during the draw step. The most frequent example of this at the time of the rule change was with Lion's Eye Diamond. The diamond makes you discard your hand to produce three mana. With the old rules, you could do this during your upkeep and draw a card during your draw step. If you knew the top card of your library was an instant, like Ad Nauseam, you could float that mana from your upkeep to your draw step to cast Ad Nauseam. These days, if you make mana during your upkeep somehow, you have to use it right away. This change wasn't really made to nerf cards though, it's just another one that was made to make the game simpler. Having this distinction between steps and phases, and when mana emptied, was actually pretty complicated. After all, what's a step and what's a phase? So it definitely simplified things for every step and phase to result in the mana emptied. Emptying. At number 5, we have a change to the way that combat damage was dealt in combat. Starting with the release of Corset 2010 in July 2009, combat damage no longer used the stack. The stack didn't always exist in Magic, more on that later, but once it was introduced in 1999, combat damage used it. So when this changed in 1999, the rule had been around for about a decade. So this means that like any spell or activated ability, combat damage was placed on the stack and resolved the same way all of that stuff did with those things most recently added to the stack resolving first. This is overly complicated for sure. Combat damage should just be its own thing that happens all at the same time, and I'm glad they changed the rules for reasons of simplicity, but it also had a massive impact on the game. This is another case where showing you a specific card can really help me elaborate on this shift. Mog Fanatic was much better under the damage on the stack rule. You could assign it to block something, or get it blocked by something, then put the combat damage on on the stack, and then you still had time to sacrifice it to use its ability. In other words, the Fnatic did one damage of combat damage, and it could do one damage with its sacrifice effect. This allowed you to take out two X1s or kill an X2. This also illustrates how unintuitive this is because if your Mog Fanatic is no longer in play when the damage is done, it feels really weird that your Mog Fanatic who's in the graveyard somehow does combat damage. These days, Mog Fanatic isn't so lucky. Now you basically have to choose between doing one damage of combat damage or sacrificing it to do one damage because it isn't around when combat damage is dealt, so it doesn't do damage now. This effect was certainly the most notable on all sorts of cards with sacrifice effects. For another example, you could originally block with Sakura Tribelder and do one damage to the thing it blocked and sacrifice it for a land. But yeah, really, this basically made every creature in the game a little bit worse because you could no longer put combat damage on the stack and then sacrifice the creature for some sort of effect. But it also made the game a lot simpler and more intuitive. At number four, I have a whole category of rules changes because there have been so, so many of them, and that is the various shifts to the legend rule. To be honest, this one has changed so much that it probably will get its own video someday, but here's the Cliff's Notes version of everything that has changed with legendary permanents over the years. They were originally introduced in 1994's Legends, and they were meant to represent unique individuals, or places. Basically, all the iterations of the legend rule are attempts to reflect the uniqueness of these individuals or places within the rules of the game. With their original debut, they were actually restricted to a single copy per deck. This part of the rule was scrapped fairly quickly though and was gone by 1995. However, Legends also introduced the idea that only a single copy of a Legend can be played at a time, and I don't just mean on your side of the table, I mean on either side. In those days, if there were two copies of a Legendary Permanent in play, the copy that had been in play for the longest span of time got to stick around, and the other went to the graveyard. In other words, if you drew a copy of a Legendary card your opponent had in play, it was pretty much a dead card. This feels pretty awful and meant whoever got theirs down first had a massive advantage. 
This rule persisted all the way until 2004 with the release of Champions of Kamigawa. This was another legendary focused set, and they thought it would be a good time to fix the feel bad problems of the original legend rule, and they did. From 2004 to 2013, if two copies of a legendary permanent were on the battlefield, they both went to the graveyard. This meant that now, if you get your legendary permanent second, at least you can treat it as a removal spell for your opponent's copy of the same card. Then, in 2013, the final Legend rule change was introduced. Now, Legendary Permanents only check their controller's side of the board for additional copies of the card. In other words, two players can now have a copy of the exact same Legendary Permanent in play. However, one player cannot have two copies of the same Legendary Permanent in play. Now, if two copies were on the same side of the board, their controller chooses one to stay in play, while the other goes to the graveyard. Obviously, these changes have caused big shifts over the years. We've had this final iteration for about a decade now, and it has certainly led to Legendary Permanents being more prominent in the game, since they no longer have as substantial of a downside as they used to. At number three, I have all the changes to the mulligan rule. Mulliganing is fairly central to magic, as it allows a player to replace her opening hand with a new one. Mulliganing has always been focused on reducing games where one player is mana screwed or mana flooded, thus making more games competitive. But how exactly that process works has changed several times over the years. Like the changes to the legend rule, this is another one that could probably use its own video, but for now, let me give you a brief rundown on how this one has changed over the years. Mulligans were part of the game from the very beginning, as they appear in the alpha rulebook. However, when one could take a mulligan was severely restricted. If your hand was either all lands or no lands, you could reveal it to your opponent, shuffle it into your deck, and draw seven new cards. You could only do this once per game. Before long, it became clear that in order for games to be the most competitive the most consistently, players needed to be able to mulligan in more situations. From 1997 to 2015, the rule was that a player could send back any hand and do it as many times as they wanted. The downside was that you drew one fewer card for each time you mulliganed. This is the mulligan rule that was in effect the longest, but it still wasn't perfect, as many players from that era can attest. The next change to the mulligan rule was introduced in 2015. Most of the rule remained the same, you drew one fewer card each time you mulliganed, but now you also got to scry one when you chose your starting hand. The final mulligan rule, so far, was introduced in 2019. Now you draw a full seven cards every time you mulligan, and then put a card on the bottom of your library from that hand for each time you mulliganed. This most recent iteration is certainly the best at minimizing mana flood and mana screw, at least in an opening hand, as it lets you really customize what you do and don't keep. Obviously, it still isn't entirely perfect. It's not like we don't get mana screwed or mana flooded, but this is a game of variance, and they're always going to be part of the game. The mulligan rule just looks to make sure that games start off more competitively, and overall, I think it's been successful. At number two, I have the introduction of the stack, as well as the related changes that eliminated the interrupt and mana source card types. This all went down in sixth edition. The stack contains all of the spells and abilities that are waiting to resolve with the most recently used ability or spell on top. The stack is still used today, of course. Before 6th edition, the game used a batch system. For batches, everything was first in and last out, just like with the stack. But there was one big difference. Damage from spells didn't happen until the entire batch had resolved. This meant something as simple as casting shock in response to giant growth didn't work because the damage wouldn't happen until after giant growth had already resolved, even if you cast your shock in response. This is another case where it didn't make a whole lot of sense that it didn't work correctly. Your spell would resolve, but not the damage from it. So streamlining these batches into the stack system we know today was a vastly different way of doing things. Sixth edition also removed the interrupt and mana source types from cards. Before the stack, interrupts and mana sources worked differently than other spells, as they both resolved before the rest of a batch did. With no batches, instants, interrupts, and mana sources would all work the same way, so once again we're looking at a rule that really simplified the game since it eliminated some unnecessary card types. The stack has largely remained unchanged since 1999, with the one exception being something I discussed earlier, the elimination of the damage on the stack rule. The stack is very central to magic and a crucial aspect as to how games of magic play out, so I definitely think this is the second biggest rule change of all time, but there is one that's even bigger. 
And that's the introduction of the basic deck construction rules that we still use today. When Magic debuted in 1993, your deck had to be 40 cards or more. And that's it. That was the only requirement for your deck. There wasn't any limit on how many copies of a specific card could be in your deck. And this makes sense. When Richard Garfield designed the game, he never really imagined people would buy a whole bunch of product and gain access to enough copies of powerful cards to just build decks that were entirely made up of these cards. He envisioned players buying a few packs and maybe a sealed deck and throwing a deck together, sort of like what Limited is today, but that is not what happened. People would get multiple copies of these insanely powerful cards and run as many copies as they wanted to, resulting in many different decks that just won on turn one with consistency. Probably the most infamous of these decks was the Channel Fireball deck, a deck made up entirely of fireballs, channels, and black lotuses or other fast mana. This would let you cast Fireball for lethal on turn one, assuming you had the mana, the fireball, and the channel in your opening hand, and you're pretty much always going to. So in 1993, if you were amongst people who were building the best deck possible, you were basically talking about a game where whoever went first won. As you can imagine, this very early era of Magic was the most broken of them all. As the game grew in popularity and it became clear there was interest in large-scale competitive events, Wizards of the Coast started to regulate the game more, resulting in the creation of the Duelist's Convocation, which ultimately became the DCI. At the end of 1994, Magic was planning to have its first World Championship, and the DCI was tasked with making sure the game wasn't utterly busted by the time that rolled around. In January 1994, along with the first ban and restricted announcement, the Duelist Convocation introduced a 60-card minimum deck for Constructed, and they made it so you could only have a maximum of four copies of an individual card that was not a basic land in your deck. This obviously had a massive impact on the game, fixing what was a very real problem for the early days of Magic, increasing its variance, and making these turn one combo kills much rarer. This rule has remained unchanged to this very day. So those are my picks for the 10 biggest rule changes in the history of Magic. Do you think there are any that I left out? Let me know in the comments. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to make sure you're caught up on past MTG Top 10s, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.